Judy, second time I'm going to cross your ocean. I'm so excited. <laughs> <laughs> uh, like, how does it feel to be in Vegas? You are not new to Vegas, right? I, I'm not new to Vegas. Um, I love Vegas. It's the craziest city you do in, love in the U.S. Yeah, I love it. I What's love it. I love, love the most. I love the energy here. You know, and so. it is, it is, it's madness. It's controlled madness. <laughs> controlled madness. Do you gamble? I do. I do. Oh. I haven't, I haven't gambled yet, but I, I plan to before I leave. Uh, you lightly gamble? Or? I like to gamble. Okay. A little bit. A little a bit. A little bit. Yeah, a little, a little bit. bit. Okay, that's cool. Seven questions like the seven C's, and we're going to work with the first one, okay? Sure. In 2006, the New York Times sent shockwaves through the literary world when it revealed that the emerging author, J.T. Leroy, wasn't what everybody thought he was. Leroy was just the creative expression of a 40-year-old housewife, Laura mm. Albert. Jeremiah Terminator Leroy did exist in Flash, but was just a young boy from the hills of Wild West Virginia who was a lot lizard. The boy was dressed up as a girl and a mom named Sarah, who was also a lot lizard. Now, the two books that were written by Laura Albert under the fake persona of Leroy became international bestseller overnight. I remember wow. those books because I bought them and the writing was perfect and it was like really at the right time at the right place and everybody got fooled. Everybody from North America down to the West Coast, down to Hollywood, like this kid was everywhere. Something just clicked with Laura Riding combined with JT Persona and crossover from literary to music, movie entertainment. It was a transatlantic experience across one culture and pop culture. It was the biggest hoax in modern literature. One of the books that burst onto the scene was titled The Hurt is Deceitful Above All Things. Has your heart ever been deceitful when it comes to making career moves to advertising? <laughs> In other words, have you ever found yourself in a role that wasn't yours and that you didn't fully recognize it? Well, I, I think that's true of everyone. I think that we use personas to jump into uncomfortable spaces, mm. right? It, I think that we all, as creatives, we have the fraud complex and we have a persona that we put out into the world and we jump into. The first time I became CCO, I just mm. thought, I have no idea what I'm doing. Um, and then when I became CEO, when I was at Leo Burnett, um, you know, it, these, are, these are big leaps that you have to take on a persona and just pretend that you know what you're doing mm. um, until you do. Until you do. It does it like to take on a persona does change something inside you? Do you have to tweak parts of your personality or you maintain like, same things, same elements inside you? Well, it depends on the person, I think. I think for me, um, it is amplifying parts of me that exist mm. that are, might be hidden. Dormant. Yeah, dormant, exactly. That might be dormant. Yes. So you like, like uh, the grass of my neighbor is beautiful because like he's dormant in the winter and then in right. the summer somehow is always like super green. Right, He's able right. to tap onto like this type of grass. Uh, so I learned the word dormant. That's why I really like yeah. it as an adjective. It is, it is a good one. <laughs> <laughs> okay. The last era of privacy before cell phone and social media was an era where creative collaboration were mainly fed by physical presence. We talk about this, mm -hmm. right? Like, it was also an era where recreating the truth to fit a constructed narrative was still possible in a time where typewriters, landlines, copy machine exist. There's a film like I'm obsessed by, and it's like my own private idol, and oh, star, yeah. you, you watched the yeah, movie, right? that's right. It starred River Phoenix. During the making of the film, River developed a very, very tight friendship with Flair, which is like the, uh, the bassist of Red Hot Chili Peppers. The two became like brothers. Mm -hmm. River and Flair would spend like countless hours brainstorming, like creating art, like two oceans from two different industries meeting in the middle. Have you ever experienced such a close creative collaboration with someone that not necessarily work in the advertising industry? And if so, what kind of impact did he have in your life or did she have in your life? 
you know, I, it's a beautiful story because I think that, I think that we need those uh, relationships and those collaborations to get better and to move forward. And I've been so lucky in having a lot of people in my life who have done that for me. And I, I think it's important to hold on to those people when you can because they make you better and they push you forward. Um, when I was at Burnett, I had a, a, a CEO and president, David Moore, and he taught me how to be a CCO when I was right. first time CCO. It was like, help me. I don't, you know, I don't know what I'm, I'm Did doing you here. Have anybody from a totally different industry that I would um, say, no mentor you, but like whose friendship help you grow in your business? Um, no, I wouldn't say that. Mm -hmm. I, 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 you know, everyone has been in the business. Everyone in yeah, the business. Yeah, absolutely. It's interesting, you know, I say that because recently I just like became friend with a, with a, with a man that's, um, he works as an engineer. He owns like a plastic company. Right. And he was telling me, oh, you are creative. I'm not creative. And then I right. asked him, well, what, do you, what do you really do? And he was like, well, you know when, uh, you know the cap of the bottle, the bottle cap of mm -hmm. the water? Yeah. I was like, yeah. So if you want to make that transparent, you have to use certain kind of machine. But if you want to make those like colored, you have to change the old system of the machine. It takes day to recharge the machine that make that. Right. So I actually developed a solvent that allow you to do that only in two hours. Right, right. And I was like, oh, so you think that I am the like, <laughs> <laughs> Right. And, uh, and, you know, we've been like in contact ever since, and he had told me so, so many things. And, and I feel like and it, it's a totally different industry. Yeah. Totally different industry, you know, but somehow his story like yeah, truly helped me like see things in a different way. Yeah, yeah. I, I can't think of anyone right now, but I think that those conversations are game changing. When yeah. you learn about someone else's business or how mm. they approach things, and, and you're right, they always say, I'm not creative like you. But then, the and what they do is creative. <laughs> you know, super it is creative. Like problem solving. It's yes. It's beautiful. It's beautiful, yes. yes. Okay, the lowest point on earth is six miles down to the ocean off the coast of the Philippines. And the highest point on earth is Nepal, and it's the tip of the K1. Now, the distance between the lowest point, the highest point, is only 11 miles. It's so pretty much is like Manhattan. If a cosmic giant were to come to Earth and rub his finger around <laughs> the Earth, he would find it smoother as a mm. cue ball. This proves that perception is everything. Our world is made entirely of what we perceive. As your perception of the advertising industry changed throughout the years, as the distance between the lowest point and the highest point in creativity reduce or these two extreme got closer? Oh, definitely, it's further apart. It's further oh, apart. Oh, yes, the highs are much higher and the lows are much there lower. There is no middle class anymore. Well, the middle, it, there's so much content right now. Like, mm. just think about all the platforms and all the things right. that are created just fill the middle. So to find those wonderful things right. or the, well, maybe there's more terrible things now. All right. Um, actually, in this moment in time on Earth, mm -hmm. it, there's probably more here, but that separation is greater. Do you think that that actually mirrors society? Because I was talking to another juror, uh, president uh, yesterday offline, and we were talking about the fact that the middle class in America doesn't exist anymore. Yeah. You have the highest and the lowest, but Absolutely. there is nothing in the middle. Mm -hmm. I feel like maybe, like as you're saying, it's like the creativity. It's mirroring like the way society is like structured. Like, oh yeah, you know, absolutely. It's true. Like our highest are truly like up there, but like there is deep. Like when you go like to the lowest. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there is yeah. greater separation. Yeah. Okay. There is a poet I really admire, and he goes by the name of like uh, Ocean Wong. Do you know him? No. It's a young kid. Uh, I think he's, a, he's in his 30s, and he's like, it, he writes beautifully. And he was born in 1988 in Ho Chi Minh City. It's Vietnamese. He was born on a, uh, on a rice farm. 
His grandmother was a young woman who grew up in the countryside, while his grandfather was a white American soldier in the Navy, originally from Michigan. A two-year-old Vuong and his family arrived in 1991 in a refugee camp in the Philippines before achieving asylum and migrating to the States. He wrote a few collection of poems, but only one novel so far, and the novel is titled On Earth, We Are Briefly Gorgeous which I found like amazing title, probably yeah. one of the best titles I ever read in my life, just title. Yes. If you could keep an altered one thing from the forgiving passing of time that defined the beauty of living, what would that be? It's a beautiful question. Yeah. I love this question. <laughs> um, I wish I could freeze something in time. You know, it would be my daughter for sure. I was thinking this. And and you know, it, what about when, your daughter? When you have kids, it you want to freeze that just um, her curiosity for everything. And is there a particular age that you want to freeze? I want to freeze every moment. Yep. You know, every uh, moment. Up until when? Like um, just always. always. A- every time I'm in a moment, I want to freeze that moment. Um, but I think it's. It's more important, and I, and I think that I've adopted this since the pandemic, is that you have to just live in that moment. You know, this moment that we have right now, just enjoy it. Is it difficult for you? No, no, it's, it's a practice, it's a practice. It's, it's been difficult over time to enjoy those moments, but. You know, it's interesting, uh, I study Latin, and uh, one of the, I would say one of the biggest like uh, misinterpretation or lost interpretation is the is the words carpe diem. Mm-hmm. When mm-hmm. it came right. to English, uh, it was translated in uh, seize the day. Yeah. But carpe diem, carpe doesn't mean seize. It means pluck. It means pluck the day. Mm. So it means like figuratively, if time was a timeline, you literally go there and you pluck the present and you remove it oh. and now you hold it in your hand right. and that is the moment that you're supposed to live. Right. So it's literally pluck the day, it's right. not seize the day. And I think like, I, I found myself like always struggling to live in the moment. It's it's like, you know, only met a few people who truly like uh, master the heart and I think when you do that, it's almost a nirvana because my mind always either go forwards or backwards, right, but right. I never sat still and say, okay, this is a moment that we are here, like just stay here. Yes. It's so difficult for me. It is, it is euphoric when you can do that. Yes. And it is moments in time where I can do that. And I think this is, I'm having the best day. This do you is, meditate? I do. Yes. Maybe that helps. It does help. It does help. Mm. Jean Beret is recognized as the first woman to have completed a voyage of circumnavigation of the globe in 1774. She was born in an age of exploration that was reserved almost exclusively for men. Yes, she found a way to break the rule and write her own destiny. The story has it that the French Navy didn't allow women on his ship back then. So when her lover and former employer, Philibert Commerson, was hired as a chef, chief naturalist for a voyage around the world, they concoct a plan. Jean Barret will become Commerson cabin mate and assistant. They will call her Jean after her father. If you were to meet Jean Barret now, what would be the first thing you would say to her? I would have two questions. What would be the first? The first question would be, what did you learn? Mm-hmm. And the second one would be, what do you regret? Oh, wow, regret. Do you regret often? I used to regret often, and that, that is the, the not living in the moment when right. you're living in the past and regretting, and there's nothing you can do. You can't go back there, but you can learn something from there. But you do find yourself still sometimes like with this word of regret around you, or, yeah. or you, you, you passed that, who you were able no, to? No, of course I still regret, uh, right. less so, less so. I try to move forward from the reg- that regret. I try to examine it, understand mm. it, what can I learn from it, and it is then something move on. happen at one point where you say, okay, right now I need to spend less time on regretting, more time on the present, or it was a natural evolution into your persona? Um, it really was the pandemic. 
The pandemic, the pandemic was controller. a game changer. Spending all that time, it was a moment in time, and I think that it's it'll be something that will be thought about and written about for for forever, forever. And I think that um, everyone dealt with it differently. And for yeah. me, it was a moment where I got to reflect. It's so interesting because. Uh, during the pandemic, like, you know, it, it's definitely a before after moment. Mm -hmm. That's for sure, right? You know, it's, it's one of those divider in history where, like, uh, <clears throat> nothing is going to be back to what it was before. I remember sometimes I found myself looking at the picture of, like, 2020 on my phone, and I see my daughter, so, like, my wife. We are living in L.A. at the time. Right. And uh, and sometimes looking at the picture, I know where we were at the moment, and, uh, and the thing that comes to my mind is like there was a time where the pandemic came and nobody knew anything. Right. And right. and like, you know, someone would pass you in the streets, like, you know, clothes and you would like, you know, uh, trying to get away from it. Mm -hmm. or like, you know, even for a second. And it, uh, uh, or like, you know, you would like, my wife would <laughs> go like grocery shopping and come back. It would take like three hours to clean everything. <laughs> right, right. Leave like, everything leave outside. Leave everything yes. outside. You know, it's like, and now you think about this stuff, but we didn't know. We had it, no idea. I think idea. it was literally one of the first time, at least in my lifetime, where the entire society didn't know. Didn't exactly. know. Like, you know, so we had no idea what we were doing. Right. And that's why everything changed. Yeah. Anyway. Once Jerry Seinfeld was asked, what made you quit the show? What's that thing that made you think, this is the last season? And he replied, it's really important if you are in everything creative to leave something in the tank, not to mm -hmm. run empty. To put it in transatlantic terms, don't drain the ocean and expect to sail away. So inspired by these words, here's my question for you. What's that thing that makes you say, the job is done here? and push you towards a new challenge. And most importantly, what do you have, what do you leave in your tank for your next adventure? Wow. Um, it, I, I think that I move on when I stop learning. And, I, okay. and, and that's when I moved to Edelman, mm. when I was at Burnett, or when I move on from any project, when I no longer feel like I can Could learn you? and push, hmm. I move on. How long were you at Le Burnett? I was there 19 years. 19 years? 19 years. years, and my job kept changing, so right. but you, it was always interesting. At one point you eat a wall. Pardon me? At one point you eat a wall and you say, it's like, I can't learn anymore. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It starts to feel like I, I know the conversation I'm gonna have, I know this is going to happen, and going to Edelman was, mind-blowing it was so different it was just learn you know i'm still learning today hmm. every so day interesting yeah talking about learning you are the president of creativity in pr category when people think of pr they elementarily reduce the discipline to press release and creating buzz around events but there is definitely more to it what parameter thank you for saying that yeah, no, I actually am one of the biggest fan of PR and yeah. I try to use PR. I think like one thing that I try to do and agency don't do, in, they don't do that. Mm -hmm. They bring PR at the end of the process. Exactly. Where they should bring PR at the beginning of the process. Actually, I'm ideally, but it's very difficult when you work in a big agency, in a big corporation to, yeah. to twist the system. But I do think that PR should actually sit at the table with creative and brainstorm with them. Mm -hmm. um, but we, we don't do that. There is, like, what kind of parameters are you using to judge the work? And what about PR fascinates you the most? Well, so many things fascinate me. You know, since I've been in, um, in the job at Edelman, it's, it's opened up my mind how to think about our clients and how to think about their business. Like when you think about advertising, it's a portion of the business that mm. you see of theirs. And PR is so much more. It is their corporate, you know, social responsibility plan, their employee engagement, their crisis management, their CEO positioning, um, public affairs. Uh, and there's so much more to the business. And I think that our job is to help shape that reputation, but also to inspire them to Definitely. 
be good corporate citizens or to do more or to contribute more in society. And I think that that's the opportunity for what we do mm. is, is greater. Um, and, you know, just talking to the jury, I said, it's not about stunts. It is about how are we helping build, you know, brands and build companies and, and how does the work forward that? Awesome. Judy, can't thank you enough. Uh, it was great crossing the ocean twice. I know. It's, it's going to be a third time too, I'm sure. It's I'm always sure. amazing, Tom. When are you going to fly you. back to Toronto? Uh, tomorrow. Tomorrow. Yes. Okay. So travel safe and thank I hope you. to see you around. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> thank you for having me.